Hi everyone and welcome to this CNCF webinar. Today we have a very cool agenda for you. For the next hour, we're gonna be talking about databases in Kubernetes and how to run them the most secure and reliable way possible. And most importantly, how to make sure business or DBA crafted guidelines can be applied and enforced during the life cycle of your stateful application. And because it's also important to walk the walk as you talk the talk, we have a couple of demos in store for you. We hope you're going to enjoy it. Again, welcome to this session, how to build Kubernetes policies to ensure compliance for databases. During the next hour, uh, we're going to be touching upon a couple of CNCF projects that are related to that topic. The first one is Flux um, by Weave, which is a, a continuous delivery solution for your application, including stateful application and databases. And the second tool uh, we're going to be talking about is Kyverno, which is also a CNCF project and is a policy engine specifically designed for uh, Kubernetes. So let's get started. My name is uh, Nick Vermundi. I'm a principal developer advocate with Ondat. I've been working with Kubernetes for the past five years. And um, before on that, I've worked with Aviatrix, a startup focusing on uh, multi-cloud networking. And then before that, I spent six years at Cisco uh, as part of the engineering team responsible for uh, the container network interface or CNI. In terms of the agenda for today, we're going to start with um, database in Kubernetes and talking about uh, what is the status in terms of the industry? Is it a safe thing to do, run database or in Kubernetes and how people do it? And we also talk about um, you know, how to do it in a way that can match the requirement of enterprises. Um, then in terms of delivering those databases in production, uh, we're going to be talking about policy as code, which is more focused around how can we put some guardrails around uh, how people you know, um, deploy databases in production. And to that same um, goal, we're going to be taking a look at GitOps principles and how to build GitOps pipelines for stateful application by also incorporating some notion of um, policies and compliance. And then, of course, we we'll conclude by a demo, which will be making use of all the principle we will have mentioned during this talk. But first, let's address the elephant in the room. Is it a good idea to run a database in Kubernetes? Or more generally speaking, is it a good idea to run stateful application within Kubernetes? So in 2016, Kubernetes introduced the notion of pet sets uh, a first try at handling stateful application as a first-class citizen. And prior to that, any application running in Kubernetes was strictly supposed to adhere to the 12 factor apps, basically a stateless application. So that's the war between pets and cattle. Over time, pet set became stateful sets and a comprehensive set of features have been added to safely run stateful applications. This includes solutions around storage, networking, identity, and application lifecycle management. Uh, so for example, you can then attach distinct persistent volumes to individual parts composing your stateful set. Uh, in terms of the network, um, network identity is guaranteed and is stable, meaning that in case of uh, pod failure, um, the same pod can be restarted on the same node or another node while keeping the same original number as well as the same host name. Then when it comes to upgrading your stateful application, stateful sets support both running updates and partition running updates to features that are critical when it comes to managing your stateful application. So all these various options can be tailored and fine-tuned to suit your need. But the real question is, 
is this sufficient to manage databases in Kubernetes? And we'll get to answer this a bit later, uh, but first let's take a look at what are the most popular container images when it comes to um, running stateful application in containers. So out of those 14 images, uh, we can notice that we have Redis, Postgres, uh, RabbitMQ, MySQL, Mongo, Kafka, um, Vault, etcd. All those containers are actually um, stateful application, meaning that they have to persist uh, some sort of data to disk, um, which makes sense because people have been running stateless application in containers for a while, but there's not such a thing as a completely uh, stateless application. You always have uh, a component that is stateful, maybe a message queuing um, solution or a database. So um, this graph shows that people now want to collocate their stateless application together uh, with their stateful component. There may be you know, different reasons for this. Uh, operations, but um, also maybe latency. Now, if we take a look at the top container images running as Kubernetes um, stateful sets, um, the result is actually very close, uh, which shows that those containers, you know, stateful containers that are popular should be run as stateful sets, not as classic deployments for the reason we mentioned uh, before. Stateful set have uh, specific requirements when it comes to uh, network identity, stability, uh, host name, and also the order of operation. Uh, when you <clears throat> deploy stateful application, you want to deploy the pods in a particular order. And if you need to scale down or if you need to upgrade um, you know, the image of uh, the application, then you need to take the reverse order. And this is really key because it's not only about deploying pods, it's making sure that the application that is uh, running on top of those containers are um, actually in a healthy state, which means for, uh, for example, for Mongo, it means that the cluster is formed. So if we remove a node or add a node, then um, the states of the cluster also needs to be updated, right? This is not automatic. And we're going to see how we can potentially um, alleviate this portion. But essentially, yeah, those stateful application needs to be run as stateful set to begin with. But it's only one part of the picture. Once you have your stateful set defined with your application template, you now need to install the application on top. And what is particular to Kubernetes is that you have now a higher level of controller, which is the stateful set controller, that controls how the containers and, and pods are provisioned and deleted, etc., and updated. Uh, you also need a mechanism to be able to install the application on top. Um, because most of the time, the application on top need to, for, to need to form some sort of cluster and organize itself as a whole, which means you need to encapsulate some sort of knowledge into code. And there's a specific pattern that actually exactly does this in Kubernetes. It's called the operator pattern. At a high level, a Kubernetes operator is just another type of uh, Kubernetes controller, but that monitors a uh, custom resource as opposed to a native Kubernetes resource. A custom resource is just an extension of the Kubernetes API that allows you to represent any objects within or you know, outside of the Kubernetes cluster as a first-class citizen within Kubernetes. So the custom controller effectively watches custom resources and any action that is performed in terms of CRUD operations, so create, read, update, delete, any action that is performed on the custom resource is translated into um, an automated action from the custom controller. 
and that can be anything. So for example, if we take maybe, you know, uh, let's say a custom resource represent a AWS cloud instance, then as you add new custom resource, the custom controller will create new instances in AWS. That's why as you delete the custom resource, then the custom controller will delete um, the instance within AWS. And you as a developer need to embed the knowledge required to do all this action within the controller. So how to delete a AWS instance, how to create in um, AWS instance, etc. So if we apply this principle to a database, then we can have a lot of benefits, right? So uh, it can automatically perform operations for statefully critical components, such as database scale, backup, upgrade, all of that can be managed by an operator and potentially simplifying the deployment scale out and scaling of cloud native application. And finally, because there is a reconciliation loop that is performed by the operator, uh, it also sort of enforces natively compliance by design. So for example, um, let's say the when you deploy the database with the operator, you set up an admin user with specific permissions. Um, so the database get deployed with that setting. And let's say you want to change that permission manually, um, you know, using uh, your database command. So what's going to happen is that because the operator is constantly monitoring uh, the database and, you know, the different components, it will revert back the permission as defined um, in the custom resource um, setting. And this is because the reconciliation loop trusts the declarative intent, not the imperative comment that um, you have applied to the environment. But the operators also come with their own set of challenges. <clears throat> so first of all, there are no standard to express um, custom resources settings for a database. For, for example, um, you know, how you want to call um, the storage, the PVC, uh, in terms of the path to that particular settings um, is not defined in Kubernetes. So every, um, every operator, creator or provider can choose its own, you know, schema to express its own settings. There are no standard across all databases, for example. And typically, once you start using operators to deploy and manage the lifecycle of um, you know, application and software solutions, you tend to get a uh, you tend to get a sprawl of those custom resources, which can lead to um, you know increased difficulty when you are troubleshooting what's happening in the cluster. Then we also have potentially challenges with the supply chain uh, quality control, as you are probably going to use existing operators rather than create your own, you need to be able to trust the people and the, the software engineers that are building those operators. Um, and finally, you know, as there are not really any standard uh, for those custom resources, how can you validate that the settings you enter and you configure for um, those schema are valid into your environment? Right. And this is what we're going to try to uh, think about in, in the next section. And finally, documentation. Uh, it's quite difficult to match exactly uh, your use case in terms of finding the documentation. Um, so you will find a lot of operators, they have um, GitHub repositories, of course, with some example of use cases. Uh, but there's not real any you know border plate for your particular use case. So you will have to find you know different pieces here and there, put them together, and just try it out. Um, you know if it works, if it really fits your use case, uh, etc. There's not like comprehensive documentation you can just find you know um, typically. However, because these 
custom resources are fundamentally Kubernetes resources, you can explore um, you know, their schema, their field, simply by using uh, kubectl explain and just specify um, you know, the custom resource you want to explore. So far, we've been talking about the operator's you know, architecture, uh, but now let's focus on you know, how to use these operators and apply some policies in terms of um, you know, the values you express in the settings. And for this, there's you know, a pattern that is well known um, as you know, policy as code. Um, one of the tools we're going to be talking about is, is Kyverno to realize this. Um, but when it comes to policy as code within Kubernetes, it's not really code anymore. A Kubernetes policy engine should just support YAML, right? Because YAML is what we do in Kubernetes. So let's take a look at how we can use policy as YAML with Kyverno and apply this to custom resources. So there are a couple of principle to be applied when you're using policy as code or as YAML. So first, we want to decouple the validation or the enforcement of the policies from the directive decisions themselves. So for example, we want to be able to store our policy independent, independently um, from the process, from the validation process. So typically, we want to use Git or any you know, version control system to store um, your policies so that you can track history, you can share with your teams, etc. So of course, it needs to be in a declarative format um, because Kubernetes already has YAML. Um, there are solutions that are introducing a new language to represent, um, you know, the, the the policy. But if you are already already running Kubernetes, this is not necessarily something you want to start with, right? We have YAML, so let's stick with YAML. And if the solution that you are um, contemplating doesn't satisfy your requirements because they are too complex, then maybe you can try a solution that involves a new language, uh, like Rego, for example. So in that sense, it doesn't have to be Kubernetes. The, the policy as code solution doesn't have to be Kubernetes to work. Um, but you should start you know, using your native tools. In the case of Kubernetes, well, let's just use YAML, right? So we also want to control and validate the source before committing to the cluster. Um, if we just rely on an admission controller, to validate or you know, mutate uh, the input, then I would say it's already too late. Uh, so for example, if you have an application composed of you know, five different manifests uh, and two of those manifests you know, don't pass the policy uh, validation, then you'll end up with three manifests deployed to the cluster and two were not deployed potentially leading to some you know, inconsistency. So it's better uh, to begin with to have the ability to use um, validation within your GitOps pipeline before deploying um, the manifest within the cluster. So optionally, it's always good to have the ability to eventually mutate the input. So if you have a non-conformant uh, input rather than unvalidating and sending an error message, what you can do is transform the input to make it you know, fit within your policy boundary. And um, so there are multiple solutions on the market that can help you with you know, building this policy as code or policy as YAML. Um, so OPA Gatekeeper, Kaiverno, Daytree are all valid examples. Uh, but for this session, we're going to uh, focus on, on Kyverno specifically. So if you look at the traditional um, process to handle any API request from a Kubernetes point of view, you can insert um, webhooks at two different um, sections within that workflow. So mutating admission and validating admission are two 
valid webhooks where you can where you can um, insert specific logic, external logic from you know any sort of software you want to integrate with Kubernetes. In the case of Caverno, uh, the validation admission webhook is used to validate or invalidate um, specific statements and in our case um, compare values against policies and if the poli the values are within the policies then um, Kyverno will, will validate um, the request and send it back to Kubernetes. In case um, the validation um, comes with a negative answer then Kyverno will return just uh, an answer saying no this is not um, this is forbidden. We are not going to uh, move forward with that request. And the, the mutating admission webhook will, again, do its own thing re regarding uh, the value um, of the different fields. If the value is not within what the policy has determined, then it's going to be changed into the value that you want to apply. And actually, we are going to demonstrate the mutating and validating capabilities of Kyverno later on during our um, our demo. And uh, but basically, Kyverno has a wide range of capabilities. We'll be talking about validation, uh, mutation. Um, so a quick uh, detail about mutation: you can use either a strategic merge patch or JSON patch, depending on the granularity uh, you need to go into when modifying. You know, a particular field or set of fields. Uh, Kyverno is also able to generate new resources when a new resource is created or when the source is updated. It also has a notion of uh, preconditions, which means that um, it can gather data from the admission uh, request payload, so the admission review, actually and reuse part of that data, save them into variable that you can further use when building um, Kyverno policies. And in addition, Kyverno supports image verification uh, through the verify images rule, which uses cosine to verify container image signature, attestations, and more stored into um, an ACI registry. And finally, uh, Kyverno has uh, created um, James Path, which is coming uh, from the name of the person who has um, developed this language. And it's actually a language that, Ky that Kyverno supports to perform more complex selection of fields and value and manipulation of all these fields um, you know, combined with filters. So let's take a look at how we can integrate Kyverno with your traditional uh, continuous integration pipeline. So a GitOps pipeline allows you to use Git as the single source of truth for both your application code and your Kubernetes manifests. They can actually sit within the same repository. It doesn't really matter as long as everything is hosted into a version control um, system. So as usual, the first thing you do in, you know, even in more traditional pipeline, you build a container from your application code. Then uh, you specify the container name, tag, and you know, other details into your Kubernetes manifests. And you can use a tool like Customize to do that. Its job will be, depending on your target environment, will uh, fill the right fields with the container information and environmental, you know, specific uh, specific values as well. So once you have your Kubernetes manifest that are ready to be pushed into your Kubernetes cluster, so you can have staging, prod, uh, dev, uh, customize overlays, then you will have a um, GitOps tool. In our case, this will be Flux that will pick them up and make sure that, that the reconciliation loop synchronize the state of the cluster with what you have within your Kubernetes manifest repository. And so on the diagram here, you can see that customize is used as part of the pipeline, but uh, Flux also supports natively customize, which means that the only thing you need to have is just the overlays 
in the community's uh, manifest repository. And Flux will be intelligent enough to leverage those overlays, create the target you know, manifests, and then use them to deploy your application within the target Kubernetes cluster. Which leaves us with a question, where can we integrate um, Kaiverno in this picture? So there's actually two solutions. The first one is you can use Kaiverno as a CLI, let's say within this uh, dotted line there. So as you build your uh, Kubernetes manifests, just after that, you can use the CLI to compare it and to check it against the, the policies that are defined as YAML file. So Kaiverno CLI will use on the one side the Kubernetes manifest YAML file and compare them against the policy that are written in, in, those, you know, um, in those YAML files, the, the Kaiverno YAML policies that are also sitting in, in the repository, right? Uh, the second solution is to use the admission controller. And then again, we can either mutate or validate. What that means is in the case of validation, uh, things will happen after um, the Kubernetes manifests has been uh, deployed in the cluster by Flux. Flux is going to first check the manifest. If there's a difference, it notices a change, then it needs to synchronize with the Kubernetes cluster. So it will send um, those files through, um, you know, like a more of a pool mechanism um, into the Kubernetes cluster and apply the manifest to the cluster. As a result, the admission controller um, will either authorize or uh, prevent the manifest from being deployed into the cluster. And then again, we're into a situation where we can have some inconsistencies because some of the manifests have been deployed, but maybe not other ones. And in the case of the mutation uh, use case, then same thing again, right? You have the single source of truth, which is sitting uh, within this repository. It's picked up by Flux. Flux uh, apply the manifest into the, the, the cluster. The admission controller then will change part of the values to match um, your, your policies or so that you, the values are within your, your policy boundaries. But then as a consequence, uh, one could argue that, okay, now the Kubernetes manifests here on the Git repo are not the source of truth because some of the values has been tampered by the admission controller. And that is a fair statement. Uh, therefore, it's up to you, you know, to mutate or validate uh, within the cluster. But my personal preference would be to keep Git as the single source of truth. So use Kaiverno in the context of a GitOps pipeline as part of a, you know, just a CLI tool um, within the workflow. So I hope this makes sense to you. And let's just sum it up. So enforcing compliance with Kaiverno, when, where, and how. So what we have been discussing so far, when? Well, ideally, during your pipeline execution, and preferably, if you're using Kubernetes, GitOps is um, the best of breed solution to implement uh, continuous integration. And um, also using Flux, then, as the continuous delivery mechanism, right? So as part of this pipeline, try to enforce compliance where obviously you want to have your um, Kaiverno policies sitting in a Git repository. Uh, how? Well, preferably using the Kaiverno CLI that will on the one side leverage the manifest in one Git repository for the, the, the Kubernetes application. And on the other side, the Kaiverno policies, which are also represented as YAML file, uh, probably on an, in another uh, Git repository. So now let's check this uh, in real life into our demonstration, where uh, we're going to be creating Flux source and customization uh, so that our application can safely be deployed in the Kubernetes cluster leveraging GitOps principle. We will validate the application using uh, the Kaiverno CLI so of cluster. And 
then just for um, you know uh, comprehensive testing, we'll also show you uh, the same thing, but this time with an admission controller that will validate and mutate uh, non-conformant resources. Let's get started with the demo. So this demo is available uh, as part of a workshop or lab um, I've developed on Instruct, and I'll make sure to put the link in one of the last slides of the deck so that you can also use it if, if, you, if you wish so. So let's launch this lab. Okay, so let's jump into the last uh, section of this lab. The first thing we're gonna do is uh, validate um, some policy uh, with Kyverno off cluster, meaning that we're gonna be leveraging uh, some application manifests so made for two distinct environments. So we have um, the, the first environment, which is a dev environment. The customized overlay is there. Um, so we have a couple of uh, components within this application. We have a front end, <clears throat> which is a web application, a Flask web application uh, displaying Marvel characters that are uh, picked from a MongoDB database. So this database, as you can see here, is um, a representation in YAML as a custom resource. So as soon as we're going to push this manifest, uh, the MongoDB operator that has been installed in the cluster will react and <clears throat> deploy a stateful set and also the MongoDB cluster on top of that stateful set. We also have a storage class. So we're going to be using uh, on that as the, the, the storage class for the stateful set. Um, so on that will be responsible for the underlying distributed storage layer. So providing features, I mean, enterprise grade features such as um, at rest and in transit encryption, uh, persistent volume replication, um, NFS, you know, share if you wish so. Uh, optimized performance, etc. But it's going to be just used as a storage class as part of this lab. Then we have the last component, which is a which is a job. So the goal of this job is just to make requests on the Marvel API and populate the database. Then the front end application uh, will display, um, you know, the information that is sitting within this database. Then the uh, production overlay is essentially a replication of the dev section, but with some um, differences. So for example, you can see in the dev environment, we have two replicas for the front end in prod, uh, we'll have five. In the prod overlay, we also have a service, um, a specific service that is exposing uh, the application in the outside world. In the dev, this is just a cluster IP, so only available within the cluster um, boundaries. And in terms of the storage class, there's also some differences. You can see in the dev environment, we have no replica, no encryption. For production, we will enforce, um, I mean, we want to enforce uh, two replicas and uh, encryption as well. And for this, we're going to be uh, using Kyiverno policies. So the validation policies are described there. So first, re in relation to the MongoDB database, what we want is to have here one uh, user admin that has, I mean, at least one admin user that has all the um, permissions that are sitting there. If you compare to the original uh, you know, manifest in the application, you can see that um, it has four different roles. Um, and on top of this, we also want to check that the um, encryption is enabled. So you can see like the kind of this object is cluster policy. All the uh, policies have this type. But again, it's just YAML, right? Nothing to, to different from a normal, you know, just Kubernetes manifest. Uh, on top of this, we also have the number of um, persistent volume replicas as defined per the storage class should be greater or equal than two. And finally, 
the maximum size of any persistent volume that is associated uh, with the uh, MongoDB community custom resource should be less or equal, equal to 10 gig. So now uh, what we want to do is validate the policies with Kaiverno um, only using the text file, only the manifest, nothing in cluster. So for this, we're just going to check that um, we don't have any policies in the cluster or any application. So there's no, uh, the application has not been deployed. We have Kaiverno that is installed, but um, we shouldn't have so cluster policy, this is the object or CPOL. We don't have any uh, policies implemented in the cluster yet. So um, before uh, checking the policy, let's introduce some, um, some non-compliant non, non uh, information. For this, we're going to go back into the editor. We're going to be using the um, production overlay to simulate this um, non-conforming uh, non conformant information we are going to delete the cluster admin permission there. We're going to also change the data volume size to 50 gig, which is uh, more than what is allowed. And then also in the storage class, uh, we're going to change the encryption to false to disable the encryption. Okay, here we go. We saved the uh, changes and now uh, we can just use uh, customize uh, to um, generate the manifests for the production environment and then pipe them into the Kaiverno CLI, uh, which will be using this directory as the source for um, the policy validation, which is exactly what I've shown you before. Okay, let's run this. And hopefully we should have uh, three errors, right? So this uh, this is the errors I've, have, uh, I've just introduced. So we have one which is uh, require Mongo permission. So we have one permission, permission missing, if you remember. Then uh, the encryption that is not enabled in the storage class and also the, the, the PVC volume size, volume size that is um, um, greater than 10 gig. Next, uh, we're going to see what happens if we um, use the dynamic admission controller for the validation. So basically doing exactly the same thing, but this time applying um, the manifest into the cluster and using Kaiverno in cluster. So we need to deploy the policies in the cluster first. Here we go. And um, if I check now the policies, there are four of them. So it should be, oh, okay, now all of them are uh, ready to go. And I'm not gonna use Flux right now to deploy the application. Uh, I'm gonna use Flux for the last one for the mutation, but it's the same principle. The, the only difference is that uh, I'm using kubectl apply rather than a GitOps um, a CD methodology. So now again, let's see what happened. If I paste the command here, again, we're going we're gonna to be using customize to build the manifest and pipe them this time, not in the Kaiverno CLI, but directly uh, kubectl apply. So uh, deploying all the manifest in the cluster. So as expected here, uh, we have errors, and this is exactly the same ones um, as before. So complaining by, uh, about uh, the uh, volume side, the Mongo per permission, and uh, the encryption. But the difference now is if I look for the application, you can see that now, like it's literally uh, when I've applied this manifest, we have part of the application that is running. Of course, we are missing the non-conformant resources, which is the storage class and the, the stateful sets. So our application is currently broken. Uh, and this is not necessarily something you want, right? So this is why I was telling you before, uh, for validation, uh, it's better to, to use it in a, in a pipeline. And as to the mutation, then again, if you're using GitOps and you mutate um, 
values as your application is getting into deployed into the cluster, is it really GitOps? Um, I'm not sure, right? But um, let, let's proceed with the next section, which which is going to be around uh, mutating these uh, resources. Uh, but first, let's delete the application altogether so that we can use um, Flux to deploy it again. Okay, so let's check that now uh, our application has been deleted. Uh, this is good. Um, now, let's apply the mutate policies there and let's take a look also at them. So in Kyverno uh, mutate, what are we going to do there? So we're going to enforce um, the admin user to have those four uh, permissions for the um, MongoDB custom resource. For the storage class, um, we're going to enforce a couple of settings here. Uh, so regardless of, of the, what the user will input in the uh, storage class manifests, uh, we will change it and force the number of replicas to two, force encryption, force the usage of um, XFS at the file system, which is the, the one recommended for, for Mongo. Um, and in terms of the volume size, we're going to enforce five gig for all the volumes that are going to be attached to the MongoDB stateful set. So not only for data, uh, but also for logs for any volume that are going to be attached there. Okay, so let's go back to uh, the console. Um, the policies have been, uh, mutation policies have been created. Let's just check now, again, the cluster policies. So you can see these three new policies are now living um, in the cluster. And um, what we need to do now is to create the, um, the flux resources so that Flux can deploy the application into the cluster in a GitOps fashion. So first we need to tell Flux uh, where is the repository to monitor um, you know, the non-conformant resources. And then we also need to create the corresponding customization uh, to tell Flux what to do with it. Okay, this is done. So now if we have, um, if we look at the uh, fleet infra repository, which is the configure the repository that hosts the configuration for Flux, uh, we've been using the apps prod YAML file, which is this one. So now, uh, if I display this uh, prod YAML file, you can see all I mean th these two resources: the, the the source, the Git repository, and the customization. So um, the repository that I've configured there is um, essentially a mirror of the changes that we made. Uh, you know, when we, we change a conformant, um, the, the conformant prod manifest into non-conformant, this is exactly what this Git repository contains. So uh, we have modified this locally within our um, Flux configuration repository. And because Flux itself it's, it's, is using uh, GitOps principle to configure itself, everything is done via Git. So we need to push the changes into our uh, remote repo. So here you go. And we can monitor the Flux customization. So after a few seconds, we should see uh, a new customization uh, getting reconciled within the cluster and the application getting deployed. And what we're going to see, hopefully, is that uh, the settings that have been set within the manifest are then going to be overwritten by uh, Kai Verano. So now let's verify the application configuration. Uh, so for this, we can check the uh, volume size for the uh, MongoDB database, and you can see that we moved from, uh, you know, 50 gig and 10 and 1 gig respectively for the data volume and uh, the log volume into 5 gig, which is what has been enforced um, by the policy. 
Now, if we also um, get the storage class, so if we um, get the storage class on that um, prod, we're going to see that, again, encryption is true, number of replicas is two, and the file system is now XFS, uh, which is what uh, the policies has enforced. And uh, finally, let's check, let's check that our application is running. So we have our job that is now completed. Uh, we have um, those five different um, replicas for the front end. And uh, we should also see a, a load balancer type service that is there. And if we go to, if we browse to that IP address on port 8080, we should see our application running. So it is there, uh, it's working. We have some uh, random Marvel characters that are being displayed on the screen as expected. So I hope you enjoyed this demo. Again, if you want to try it out by yourself after, the link will be in the next slide. So a few takeaways for today. First, uh, we've seen that Kubernetes is now ready for hosting databases and run cloud native data. The only thing is that the key is to make sure that you can reach the right level of availability, scale, and performance. So the underlying storage solution is also very important to make sure that you can run these stateful workloads with enterprise-grade features. Uh, we've, all, we've also seen that GitOps and Policy as Code principles provide best-of-class paradigms to manage enterprise application lifecycle. So we've been testing uh, Flux, we've been testing Kyverno. And finally, um, let's embrace this principle to enhance your platform security, facilitate collaboration uh, between development teams, and ultimately experience faster innovation cycles. And finally, a couple of action on your side. So again, if you want to test the lab, you've got the link there. Or if you want to learn more about on that, we also have other labs you can try out. Uh, the link is also displayed there. You can test on that in your cluster, on the SaaS portal. Also subscribe to our newsletter. And if you want to chat with the on that team or with myself, you have any question about uh, this session, then you can join us on Slack. So again, thank you for making it uh, through the end. Uh, this was a uh, webinar I really enjoyed doing for the CNCF. I hope to see you in the next one.